Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. And I really think that when he said prepared, he meant that the mind had to be open. It had to be very curious. But there had to be some effort that took any thought, idea, or concept to the point where he investigated and found some real understanding, some real truth. Now, nature is, is very interesting in that it will give us some subtle clues, and sometimes they're very subtle. But the mind has to be open and has to act on these clues before you're going to have a discovery, uh, discovery point or a disruptive innovation or disruptive concept or a game-changing idea. Now, one of the best examples that I know of is Archimedes. Archimedes was given the challenge by the king to say, hey, how much gold do I have in my crown? Is it 100%, 90%? And Archimedes wrestled with that for a while. He knew the concepts, he just couldn't put it together. And one day he was getting ready to take a bath, and as he stepped into the tub, he noticed the water rising. There was a clue. And all of a sudden, in an instant, his mind put everything together, and he had a discovery point, which I call, and it's a disruptive concept of disruptive innovation. He understood that there was a direct relationship and how it related to volume, mass, and density, and he said, I got it. He jumps out of the tub and ran streaking to the king, and he was totally oblivious that he didn't have a stitch of clothes on. I think that when the mind has a disruptive idea or reaches that discovery point, that the euphoria that follows is such that the subconscious wants to continue to seek events that, that can make that occur. And I think that that's one of the interesting things about discovery as opposed to rote learning. And I challenge the educators to figure out how they can get discovery into the education process. How can educators get parents to use that method of discovery to give the brain the euphoria that wants to move on and look at more discovery points? One of the things that I have found over the last 20 years in professional life is that Discovery just doesn't have to be related to your work. It can, be take, it can take place during everyday living. I have 12 patents. I've got a couple more coming on this far UV light. But a patent is just one form of a disruptive concept. Uh, let me give you some examples of what occurred in everyday life. I volunteer a lot of my time to solve this milfoil problem in the state of New Hampshire. Milfoil is a fast-growing weed. It can grow uh, an inch per week. Uh, it will totally block out a lake, a stream, a river. In three or four years, you can't fish, water, or boat. And the method we've been using today was to throw herbicide at it every three or four years to try to clean it up. Nobody was taking the time to try to really understand that. We got some divers together, the lake that I was on, and we started just pulling plants. And we said, look, at some point, we're going to get all these plants out. Well, after a couple of years after we treated the lake, and pulling plants, by the second year, we only had a handful of plants grow back. We said, aha, we really have got this thing under control. Well, the next year, we had a 1,000. I said, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we have no clue. So we said, OK, State, find somebody that can see if this plant is making seed, because that's the only thing that made sense. And the state got the Army Corps engineers, and they found out, sure, this plant is making seed, and it's making 50,000 seed per acre. That's as many as corn stalks in this cornfield. And we said, all right, game-changing idea. We have to, at all costs, keep this plant from seeding every year. You have to do whatever it takes to prevent it to produce seed so that now there is a chance that we can get this milfoil eradicated, get it out of our lakes and streams. I went on to, uh, in my professional work uh, I got called from a professor at UNH that said, hey, Ed, you're doing some wastewater work. You're looking at water. Would you go down and help a local wastewater treatment plant get their, uh, their affluent bacteria counts down? They're, they're exceeding the levels that are allowed to go into a river. And I started looking at that, 
and found a number of issues. But one of the things that became very interesting to me is why they were using 254, so-called germicidal UVC, to kill the bacteria in the water. And I started looking at that after I had left, and I found that I couldn't find any more information except at the 254, 250. There was no information at wavelengths shorter than that. And I said, you know, the DNA has got to have some strong chromophores at other places in the spectrum. And it took, I had to go back to 1935 to find a book that showed this, this curve on the left-hand side that you're looking at. And that said, at 200 nanometers, wow, here's a real strong peak. And I wonder if we hit that peak, we're going to get a better kill. Well, sure enough, made a lamp, hit that, hit that uh, peak chromophore, and we got 10,000 times better kill than we could with even bleach or with UVC. So we said, hey, you know, we've got something significant here. Let's see if we can see what it's going to do. And that became a curiosity point. If we're killing bacteria, what are we doing to the bacteria that actually kill it? So we found somebody at UNH that had a micrograph. They took a picture of the bacteria. We did some bacillus atrophius. And we were able to get all of them killed in a very, very short time. And we took it over. They took a micrograph. That's the lower video, the lower screen that you see is 1,000x. And you can actually see part of the bacteria is fractured, segmented off on the end. And then the wall is ruptured. You can see a fracture in the wall. Well, that to me was like seeing water on Mars. I had never seen what light had done to bacteria to actually put an arrow through its heart. UVC typically is known to just create a dimer. The bacteria is still alive. It just doesn't replicate. But far UV is actually killing the bacteria. We went on to do some tests with other bacteria just to say, hey, how potent is this, this device? Do we really have a significant tool here for killing bacteria? And we, we uh, tested all the various antibiotic-resistant bacteria, Mercer C. diff, VRE, Acinetobacter. And it was like if we had a million here on the table, the way they light over it, you might have one left. So it was a very, very potent germicide, a very potent sporocyte. As part of seeing what it was doing to bacteria, we said, gee, this might be a natural for healthcare. And so we talked to some healthcare people, and he said, well, we see that you're killing bacteria, but how are you reducing healthcare acquired infections? And I said, well, if we don't have bacteria, are we going to have healthcare acquired infections? He said, well, you've got to do some reports. Well, meanwhile, there's 100,000 people dying of healthcare acquired infections and getting infections all the time, and they're waiting for the reports. At some point, we'll have some reports, but we said, you know, we got to see what else we can do. If healthcare doesn't want to use it, let's see what else we can do with this. And one of the concepts that I had had working with poor Weinsteins was that um, the knowledge of understanding how light interacted with materials was saying, geez, you know, a back of the envelope calculation says this is not going to penetrate the epidermis. If it doesn't penetrate the epidermis, it doesn't get into live tissue, it can't do any harm. So we did some tests. We found a group that would do some tests, and they laid a thin epidermis, human epidermis, over some T cells and exposed it for five minutes, and we didn't hurt the T cells. We took the epidermis off and exposed it. We killed all the T cells. Did it for 10 minutes, same thing. No, no damage to the T cells. We said, oh, you know, we've got something really significant. With that data, my brother volunteered his hands. We exposed his hands for five joules. There was no erythema, no purpura, no damage to the skin. We said, you know, that just proves that we've really got an innovative technology, a disruptive technology. And so we look at the threshold limit value curves created by the American Conference on Governmental Industrial Hygienists. And these are curves that they say you can have safe UV exposure up to these limits, that curve. And one of the things that you notice is it just has UVA, B, and C. It doesn't have far UV at all. And we're saying, you know, from the tests that we do, there should be far UV. We've ge generated a significant technology. It's here to stay. There's a lot of science based in this. And we need a far UV section on that curve. And the difference of that is the data that we took. The data that we took showed that far UV is is so much better 
than anything that they had thought of before. So to, so to wrap up the idea of far UV, you have UVA, which is the black light, UVB is sunburn, UVC is the germicidal. Far UV is sandwiched right behind that to the vacuum UV. The vacuum UV is just that part of the spectrum where if you're going to do work, you have to do it in a vacuum. Otherwise, those photons are absorbed by oxygen and water. So the things that we started looking at was, I wonder what else we can do with this far UV light. Well, there happens to be moles and fungi in the corn fields and wheat fields that is really starting to affect the production quality of corn and wheat in the world. And we looked at, looked at these moles. These are aflatoxins and fusarium moles. And we found that what has happened with these moles is that they've mutated and progressed to the point where their chromophore is not being uh, hit by the sunlight. They're in the shore wavelength region. So we took our shorter wavelength far UV light and exposed it to the, the moles and the mycotoxins. We killed it dead. We said, aha, we've got a good source here. Um, we also did aspergillus, which is a fungi. Did the same thing. So we're saying, OK, far UV is pretty significant. It's a new technology, and we think that it's going to have its place. And you're probably going to hear about far UV in your food disinfection and uh, healthcare uh, operations as we go further down this road. But to digress, just, just to back up just a second on technology, one of the interesting myths that occurred in the United States around 1900 was that the US Patent Office wasn't going to issue any more patents because all, everything had been invented. Well, since then, we've had six and a half million patents, which to me says that we're just starting to scratch the surface. And I can see where um, sometime in the distant future, maybe in the near future, there's somebody in a laboratory sitting there saying, hey, I think I can get molecules to move in time and space. And they're working on this machine. Can you imagine when you want to be a fly in that lab? Here you are, the person's twisting this knob and pushing this button and changing this switch. All of a sudden, they get this disruptive moment. They change this, they change that, they change this. Look around in the lab and they find a little toy, little toy soldier. One of their kids' toy soldiers, they put it on the table. Instead of pushing the button, they start spinning the wheel. And all of a sudden, that toy soldier moves from the right of the table to the left. Can you imagine the, the discovery moment, the disruptive concept that goes through that person's head? The euphoria that now it's not a fantasy any longer. Beam me up is a reality. Beam me up, Scotty, is a reality. And can you, if, if it was me or one of you, can you imagine what I would say when I went home that night, walked into the door? I would say, hey, hon, I want to borrow one of your parakeets tomorrow and take it to work, all right? <laughs> so I want to leave you with one of my favorite expressions by Arthur C. Clarke. And it says that any sufficiently advanced technology is the same as magic. Thank you very much.